In the second session this afternoon, we're going to start off with tracks titled Outcomes and Measures. And our track chairs here are Jabal Bay and Ming Fei Lee. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you again for joining us and welcome back. Um, so Ming Fei and I are co-chairing this afternoon's track. Uh, and in line with um, Dr. Hesse's excellent address this morning, this track is all about data. So the underlying theme across all of these seven presentations is that they exploit data, including big data, in conjunction with advanced quantitative techniques to help us answer sort of these really important questions in healthcare. Um, the topics sort of run the gamut of different areas in healthcare, but the other sort of underlying theme that connects all of these studies is that they provide valuable inputs to stakeholders, consumers, healthcare providers, policymakers, in terms of how to more efficiently make decisions and allocate resources across the system in the healthcare space. So without further ado, um, our first presenter is Swati Mukherjee from Economics. I hope I remember to put, oh, there it is. Good afternoon, and thank you for this opportunity to talk about this project that I'm doing with Mingfei. A large number of a large number of measures claim to assess quality of hospitals. And here is a list of some major ones, like the HCAPS, which has now replaced Press Ghani to measure patient satisfaction, the CMS, Consumer Reports, US News and World Report, all widely known. We also have others like Leapfrog, Joint Commission, Truven Health Analytics, and others. And some states, like Florida, have their own reports. So with all these awards floating around, there has been the inevitable fallout. The awards begin to sound similar. Best hospitals on a roll. America's best hospitals. 100 top hospitals. And one third of US hospitals have at least one rating to boast of. However, this boasting may not come cheap since many charge hefty licensing fees. For instance, Health Grades charges 145,000, US News 50, and Leapfrog 12.5. Consumer reports will not let hospitals use their ratings, but of course you have to have a subscription. And the Joint Commission does not have any licensing fees. Now some hospitals suffer, especially those that care for the sickest patients and the underprivileged, since these factors are not controlled for in the rankings. Consequently, some unintended incentives. A recent study by the American College of Surgeons found that the sickest patients were being removed from the waiting lists of organ transplant centers. The myriad ratings can give wildly divergent results and thereby cause patient confusion. And I'll give some egregious examples. Bolivar Medical Center in Cleveland was given the gold seal of approval by Joint Commission, an A grade by Leapfrog, and bottom ranking from Consumer Reports. CMS's top 100 hospitals omitted the top four out of five hospitals in the US news list. And finally, nearer home, St. Vincent Hospital in Worcester was recently in the news for removing a kidney from the wrong patient. And yet, it received high ratings from two agencies. And to help confused patients, we also have a website run by the informed patient institutes that rates the ratings. Measuring quality in any service industry is difficult because defining the output itself is problematic. In the complex workings of a hospital, we have a large number of products, each with multiple dimensions of quality. Another problem is that depending on the stakeholder, the quality measure may need to be different. That this fact of different perspectives seems to have been quite lost. Quality measures today still broadly follow Don Abedian's framework, which was in the mid-60s, which focuses on measuring structure, process, or outcome. Structure is the environment of the institution. Are staff credentials up to date? Process refers to how care is delivered. Was the diagnosis accurate? Was the therapy appropriate? An outcome is the result. What is the rate of post-operative infections or survival rates? Though patient experience was not part of the Donabedian structure, it is becoming very important now. With existing measures being complex, with many steps of aggregation and use of sophisticated statistical modeling like latent models, it is extremely difficult for any stakeholder to know what is driving that measure. 
There is also no adjustment for the type of hospital. For instance, in the latest CMS rankings, a criticism is that it penalizes teaching hospitals and those serving underprivileged populations. There's also a disparity in the data points taken for each hospital that's leading to an uneven playing field. We will create for the patient a simple, targeted, transparent composite index based on Don Abadian's categories, but expanded to include patient satisfaction scores. By controlling for the type of hospital and using the same measure for all hospital, we will level the playing field. We will correlate our rankings of hospitals with 30-day readmission rates, which is universally accepted as an objective measure of the quality of care. Finally, we will compare our measure to two well-known measures of quality to investigate the impact on hospital rankings. Robustness tests with different weights to satisfaction scores will be carried out. So we hope to demonstrate that sometimes less is more. Thank you. Thank you, Swati. I would love to know what's the top rated hospital in the Boston area if I am ever unlucky <laughs> enough to get admitted to one. <laughs> so our next presenter is Nilam Shetty from the Center for the Integration of Science and Industry. Hi, everyone. Good afternoon. Today I would like, uh, I'll be talking about the, how we can use the natural language processing to develop technology forecasting models. So let's begin. So we know that the technology forecasting is used in many industries to know that whether the technology is used, is ready to be used. And we can use this technology forecasting models for the different sectors which has very high risk of the failures during the clinical trials. And these failures are costing us a lot of money in billions, and it is growing day by day. So by research, we also know that there is the ability of the, to, uh, to develop the successful products in different sectors which is highly correlated with the technology maturation. And as the technology grows, while growing, it shows that the S curve, and we have the initial phase, the exponential growth phase, and the establishment phase. And here our goal is to model this S curve, and we, need, we want to check whether during the exponential growth phase are we getting the new exponential idea after initiation. And once we are answering the all question, are we achieving the establishment phase? So, because this pattern is leading us to the successful drug development process and we want to monitor this. So here we have fetched the data for, uh, from the PubMed for the, different, you know, for the different technologies and we have stored that data in Postgres. And we are using the natural language processing to clean the data, to process that. And we are forming the different biograms and we are trying to find out whether, the, whether we are getting any kind of pattern in those biograms, which will be helpful for the technology forecasting model. So this analysis here you can see uh, is for the monoclonal, monoclonal antibodies, which shows that the frequency for each term is changes over the time. And as we go, we can clearly see that the mouse technologies are uh, decreasing over the time, and whereas the human technology are increasing over the time, which shows that our technology is maturing over the time. And when we see the frequencies of the bigram over the years, we can see a lot of variation in the word usage during the initial phase, but as we are approaching the exponential phase and uh, afterwards the establishment phase, the word usage in literature becomes constant, which is the indication of the technology maturation. And here the graph shows the same thing. We can find, we can see there is a very, very low correlation in first graph for the mid-growth year and the established year. But as we are approaching, uh, seeing the correlation between the established and the approval year, it is very high, and which, uh, which you know, establishes our concept that, again, literature becomes constant with the technology maturation. So this is our first step to, uh, to us using the natural language processing to develop the technology forecasting model. And we are, we are scaling this up to, to monitor the more than 500 technologies and come up with the technology forecasting model, which will be more efficient and useful in the drug development process. Thank you. So our next presenter is Rob DeLeo from Global Studies. 
Good afternoon, everyone. I'm a, a political scientist by training, so as you might imagine, staying within this four-minute time limit we have right now is, is <laughs> going to be really painful for me, but I'll do my best not to ramble on, although I think I just lost 30 seconds, so I'm just going down that road. Um, so <clears throat> my uh, research uh, basically focuses on a, a, a subfield of, of public policy that looks at this concept of agenda setting. Uh, an agenda setting, broadly speaking, asks why do policymakers pay attention to some issues but not other issues? And then more importantly, is there uh, any factors that can help us sort of predict when an issue is likely to rise onto the legislative agenda or the agenda of a regulatory agency? Um, now, I know most of you are probably saying, especially those of you who are familiar with the United States Congress, well, they don't pay attention to any issues, so it doesn't <laughs> matter. Um, but that's actually not true. They, they will pay attention to things every now and then. And, and those of us who are uh, working in the policy sciences have identified a number uh, of common catalysts that can raise issues uh, to uh, the importance of actually cracking the legislative agenda. So for example, uh, the term focusing events refers to disasters or large-scale catastrophes that all of a sudden uh, uh, grab our attention and, and fixate policymakers on an issue. Think 9-11, Hurricane Katrina. Um, feedback uh, is information that's generated from the implementation of a particular policy or a program that suggests that perhaps that policy or program isn't performing as we expected it to, and it may require revisions. Think the current debate uh, over the future of the Affordable Care Act or Obamacare. And then there's this other category uh, known as indicators. And, and indicators are, are, are really uh, what I would uh, argue as some of the most basic agenda catalysts that exist. And indicators are just measures or metrics or data documenting a problem. Think uh, annual reports documenting the number of opioid overdose deaths, annual T ridership, numbers. And these numbers get filtered back into the political system. Um, now, the graph I have here. Um, shows uh, the number of references in uh, public policy journals to these different concepts between the years 2000 and 2015. And what you can see is uh, overwhelmingly this concept of indicators is referenced uh, at, at a much higher rate than any of these other agenda catalysts, which implies, at least, uh, that this is sort of an important part of the policy literature lexicon on agenda setting, and also is probably an important part of actually influencing public policy, to the extent that those of us who actually study public policy have the capacity to, to uh, understand it. Yet, a closer review of these, these articles revealed um, that close to 90% of them uh, actually made 11 or fewer references to the term indicators, and uh, only two of them made greater than, than 15 references to this academic context. And I, I bring this up because this small number of references per articles is actually emblematic of a much larger problem within uh, the policy literature, and that is that while a lot of scholars will sort of uh, make a passing note or passing reference to how a change in cases captured policymaker attention or Congress was suddenly drawn to a new data set that emerged, very few of them actually take the time to empirically model how this information is shaping the agenda setting process. And astoundingly, of all these articles that were written, uh, almost none of them tried to devise anything that even resembled an empirical or a quantitative model that would allow us to causally predict when data and information actually creates public policy and policy change. And given everything we've talked about today, in this new age of big data and healthcare information, you can imagine that understanding what types of information policymakers care about is going to be important going forward as we try to shape agendas. So I uh, took on uh, the, the um, gargantuan task of trying to come up with a model, an empirical model, that could actually predict when policymakers would pay attention to, to some cases and uh, some data points and not others. And I used the negative binomial regression model because I wanted to really focus on count data. And the negative binomial regression model was especially relevant to the types of cases I chose. Uh, I chose to look at uh, Ebola and pandemic influenza policymaking. 
and this decision uh, was uh, uh, partially self-serving. These happen to be areas I've been studying for the last 10 years, so I had this data readily available. But at the same time, uh, what's unique about these public health cases is we find that the data points in these domains tend to be much less contested than the data points we find in other domains, meaning there's general consensus among policymakers that measures of human cases and deaths are the best representation of the size and scope of a disease, right? So we can bat around all sorts of different economic indicators, but if you say that the number of Ebola cases tripled in a year, most policymakers would probably agree that that's a problem. So it sort of reduced my uh, universe to a, to a manageable indicator. And so what my model and, and all the data that, that I uh, uh, measured uh, through these models is, is demonstrated on my poster and I'm happy to show you. Uh, basically, I try to measure the relationship between the number of human cases of either Ebola or pandemic influenza and subsequently what, what the scope of policymaker attention was. So does, do policymakers talk about these issues more as the cases increase across time and then more importantly, can we policy scientists discern any patterns that may help us predict how attention will play out in future instances? And uh, really, uh, my, my paper revealed uh, three very important things. One is there's clearly two patterns of indicator accumulation that can, can capture uh, policymaker attention. One of them's better for actually creating law than other. The first is what I would call rapid indicator accumulation. And this is where the number of cases multiply very quickly and the issue almost bowls its way onto the agenda. Think of the 2014 Ebola epidemic, the 2009 swine influenza pandemic, where you have a large multiplying of cases almost overnight. In those instances, policymakers are very likely to talk about the issue, but it's unlikely that they're actually going to create policy to fix that issue in part because that issue will wane from the agenda almost as quickly as it got on there. In the other instance, we have what I call gradual indicator accumulation, and that sees the number of cases slowly emerge across time, stoke policymaker and public fear, and gradually make their way onto the agenda. When an issue has time to gestate and sort of uh, uh, percolate in the policy arena for a while, then we tend to see true policy change. And the example I would give there was the fear that surrounded the H5N1 uh, bird flu, a pandemic that never came to be, but which resulted in substantive policy change. And then one final point to note, uh, sometimes the data needs help and it needs a nudge from a large scale event before we pay attention to it. So 9-11, for example, was actually quite instrumental in elevating policymaker concern with Ebola. Uh, you'd probably say, well, what did the two have to do with one another? Uh, well, that data was seized on as an opportunity to promote a larger bioterrorism agenda that sort of emerged in the wake of the event. So sometimes in the policymaking world, seemingly unrelated things can converge in fortuitous ways for policy change. Uh, and, and, and data, of course, underlies all of that. So happy to talk about uh, my findings in more detail and my model in, in greater detail in a moment. Our next presenter is Fred Ledley. Bear with me from the Center of Integration of Science and Industry, from Management and National Applied Sciences. I'm tired already. <laughs> uh, so, um, we're going to, I'm going to talk briefly about a study being done by primarily by two undergraduates in our lab, Roger Dew and over the summer, Jonathan Lee, um, where we're collecting data on the finances of all the uh, pharmaceutical companies, all the healthcare related companies in the S&P 500 to ask how, report, how the finances of these companies relates to the healthcare innovation ecosystem. And by that, we, we mean the progress of research, but also the funding of research. Uh, and the first metric we're looking at is R&D spending. So the healthcare is not only an enormous industry, we heard about that earlier today, but it's driven and supported by an ecosystem of research, uh, by industry, by um, corporations to a much smaller extent, 
by foundations that is about 100 to $120 billion a year on research. Um, that 120 billion gets about 30 to 40 new drugs a year, and you can multiply out about how many billions of dollars it costs to get a drug out. So um, what we've done <clears throat> is using CompuStat, we pulled out, and this is purposely too small to see, don't worry, um, <laughs> on the profits, the revenues, different measures of revenue, R&D spending, and other uses of cash by these companies. And let me show you a couple of highlights. So this is every healthcare company in S&P 500 uh, cumulative data between um, 2000 and 2015 or the change. These are frightening numbers. The cumulative revenues of these companies is $21 trillion. Gets to be real money after a while. Of the $21 trillion, there's $1.7 trillion in net income. That's a lot of money. Keep that number in mind when we talk about where it goes. Um, there has been almost a tripling of uh, earnings per share and roughly a 200% a, you know, increase in the market value of these companies. That sounds good. Looks like they're growing, but we don't think so. We're currently looking at several hundred acquisitions these companies have done over the past 15 years. And we're wondering whether the val cumulative value of these enterprises now is in fact greater than the cumulative value of the enterprises in 2000. We don't think so. Um, there's almost two trillion invested in R&D. So I'm a scientist, that's great. I'm very excited by having my colleagues having two trillion dollars to play with. Um, there has been a tremendous increase in the number of employees, that's good, hopefully some of them are doing research. Uh, if you go down Kendall Square, you'll see a lot of them are there. Uh, but again, we don't know that that's really going up. The most striking number is over a 700% increase in debt. This is an industry that had very little debt in 2000, and now has over $600 billion of accumulated debt. Um, there have been also about $1 trillion of stock buybacks. We find this very troubling. This is money simply given to shareholders with the intent of rise, raising corporate value when there's a fair amount of evidence in fact does not raise corporate value. We're very interested in the timing of buybacks if we could track it down to things like executive sale of stock, which is rumored to be one of the real drivers. Um, and the cumulative distribution of cash to shareholders is, is about 1.6 trillion if you count in dividends. So this is money taken from sick people, to be blunt, and given to investors. And those two populations have an extremely different demographic. Now, to get back to the R&D, there is a striking association between the size of most companies and the amount they're spending on R&D. But if you look at the bottom of the graph, there are a lot of companies with a lot of revenues that do no R&D. And about a year ago, a paper in the, New in the Journal of the American Medical Association Point, really asked, why are there so many companies in the healthcare space living off what you guys are doing and no R&D? So this is a problem. What we're interested in is this, this dual, the dual role of, role of the industry. That on one hand, it's about people, it's about health, it's about the, an expression of our humanity to take care of the weakest citizens in our communities, but it's also about profits and it, do, have we found the right balance? So happy to talk to you about it. and. We're just really beginning a more detailed analysis. Great, thanks, Brad. <laughs> Our next presenter is my co-chair, Ming Fei Li from Mathematical Sciences. Okay, thank you. Uh, I'd like to talk about uh, this project at VA Medical Center. So I, coll uh, I collaborated with uh, psychiatrists and clinicians over there. So this is a clinical study. So <laughs> don't be scared by seeing those medication <laughs> names over here. So uh, uh, for mental uh, disease, well, specifically our focus over here is bipolar disorder. So I don't know anyone 
uh, heard about bipolar disorder, this kind of a disease. Some patients is very depressed sometimes, and after a while, it's, just, uh, 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 it's very, uh, it's very excited, <laughs> too excited. So, so this is uh, in the second generation. Antipsychotic medication is a group of medication uh, used widely in mental disease. So in psych, uh, in bipolar disorder, in PTSD, and also in psych, uh, uh, schizophrenia. So uh, these group of medications uh, typically uh, consist of uh, olanzapine, quetiapine, uh, risperidone, ziprazidone, and aripiprazole. So these, being, these medications were invented and been used over 20 years. And these medications were invented not at the same time, of course. The older one is olanzapine. The, young, the youngest one is uh, aripiprazole. All of them are currently widely used, and clinicians are always wondering, are these new medications really better than the old ones? Right? People all wonder about this. New medications are coming out, and doctors would want to recommend it to their patients, and also, of course, it means high price about insurers as well. So that is what focus and motivation of our study. Okay. Uh, so, well, new medications are supposed to be better, <laughs> right? So, but, but in, the, in our study, our result, the, well, this is one of the major results from our paper, uh, recently accepted by bipolar disorder. It shows that actually the older medication, lithium, is, performs better. This is actually the best. So this is a survival curve on the all causes hospitalization within one year after their medication initiation. So we in this uh, in, in our study we used the VA medical centers uh, uh, data uh, from 2003 to 2010, and with a very conservative criteria cleaning, we actually rule out quite a few. Uh, uh, people, so like they never have, they must have the first diagnosis in this study period. They must never have, like for example, uh, uh, the similar medications before. So we still down to have uh, 27,000 patients. This is national wide in VA system. Uh, they, these are all people who diagnose as a bipolar and uh, uh, under this treatment. So it. Our major result basically shows the best one is actually is lithium uh, as a monotherapy, and the worst one is the combo therapy of SGA uh, with valproate. Combo therapy currently in medical field in treatment is also a rising interest uh, in, among a lot of practitioners in many different kind of disease. So there are quite a few studies going ongoing to try to see, okay, so whether the combo therapy. So some of the studies showing this is positive, but at least our study is currently showing the combo therapy actually is not as good as the monotherapy, even not as good as the, the older medications. So there, there are a lot of details, but I, I don't think I have time to talk about over here. I put it in a poster, and uh, I would love to, uh, uh, to, to accept any questions and comments. Thank you. Thank you. Our next presenter is Panapa Changpach from Mathematical Sciences. And Panapa has to run right after her presentation to her class, which is eagerly awaiting her exam. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, but she would really appreciate any questions or comments you have via email. So thank you. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, my talk today is about alcohol co uh, consumption. Uh, alcohol consumption in Thailand, where I'm from. So this uh, study, uh, we, uh, uh, we analyzed the relationships among uh, the household expenditure spent on alcohol, spent on tobacco, spent on gambling, and the other 14 uh, predictors, including, for example, the household income, age, religion, sex, educational level of the head of the household. Okay. The data that we used uh, is from uh, the socioeconomic survey in Thailand in 2009. So there are about 40,000 uh, about 40, households uh, from uh, this survey. And we used uh, two techniques, uh, two new techniques to analyze these, uh, these relationships. One, TreeNet, which is the data mining technique that can explore nonlinear relationship for the big data. Two, di uh, directed a cyclic graph or DAG, which is the new technique that you can use to analyze the indirect and direct re uh, relationships among the variables. So I would like to uh, 
give us, uh, let you see the result from TreeNet. So the four important predictors that are important to predict uh, the proportion of household expenditure spent on alcohol are one, the household expenditure on tobacco, two, uh, through three and four, uh, 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 sex, religion, and uh, age of the head of the household. So on your top left, so that figure, so you can see a jump. Uh, it implies that uh, when the proportion of the tobacco, the household expenditure on tobacco uh, reaches uh, 0 0.005, uh, there's an increase of the proportion of uh, household expenditure spent on alcohol. And for the second plot on your top right, so you can uh, see two drops. Okay, at age of the household head, uh, at age of 50 and 60. So, and then there's a third plot on your bottom left. So it implies that the household with um, uh, the Muslim household head is predicted to uh, spend less on alcohol compared to the household uh, with a Buddhist uh, household head. And the last plot on the bottom right, so this implies that uh, household with a female household head is expected, is predicted to spend less on alcohol uh, compared to the household with a male household head. So now next, I would like to uh, show you the result that I obtained uh, from uh, directed a cyclic graph. So from here, so you can draw many information here. So for example, first of all, uh, the uh, expenditure on alcohol has a direct uh, effect on household expenditures on tobacco and gambling. Two, for the religion on your top left, okay, uh, the religion has a direct effect on household uh, gambling expenditure, but it doesn't have a direct effect on um, uh, uh, alcohol expenditure and uh, tobacco expenditure. But it has an uh, indirect effect through uh, re uh, region of the household. And the third uh, example of the information that you can draw here is you can notice uh, the sex of the household head. So it has a direct effect on uh, both uh, tobacco expenditure and uh, alcohol expenditures. So from here, you can draw uh, several um, inter uh, conclusions. So I hope. Uh, to answer your questions more, but I have to get back to my class. <laughs> so if you have any question, uh, just uh, feel free to drop any emails. So thank you. Thank you. Our last speaker is our dear chair, <laughs> Davo, <laughs> from Economist. He's going to tell us about winning a wage on uh, infant health. Oh, thank you guys. Can I just get the clicker? Yes. Thank you. And I will time myself just to be fair. <laughs> <laughs> all, right. Um, all right, so this actually, this project is in the realm of public health. Um, and recently, there have been several calls to raise the national, the federal minimum wage from its current level of $7.25 to $10.10, and even to as high as $15 an hour, um, as several large US cities have recently adopted. Um, but the national debate on the minimum wage has expectedly centered on its economic effects. Um, that is, how does it affect businesses and how does it affect its workers? So on the one hand, you have proponents who would say that raising the minimum wage will reduce poverty levels, it will reduce income inequality, it will raise earnings. And on the other hand, you have opponents who say that raising the minimum wage will raise labor costs, it might potentially reduce employment, um, it might even raise consumer prices. So what has been really missing from this national debate and the literature is what are the broader spillover secondary effects of the minimum wage on non-economic domains. So for instance, one would think that the minimum wage might potentially also have effects on the health of adults and workers and their children. And why would we expect this? Well, um, in this study, for instance, we show that a $1 increase in the minimum wage raises on average household income by about $1,000 per year. So that is not a non-trivial change in income, especially for low educated households. And income changes of that magnitude would be expected to affect health as well as have other non-economic effects. Um, and so with that in mind, this is part of the larger project that we're working on, that is how does labor market policies affect healthcare and healthcare decisions. In this particular study, we're looking at how does the minimum wage affect infant health. 
Um, and we're specifically focusing on pregnant women because pregnancy is a relatively short period of time. It's a, it's a, it's a nine month window. We can cleanly identify that window. We can cleanly identify what is happening to the mother's income during that window and around that window, and then statistically test what effect does that have on the child's health. So in order to do that, we gather data from two major sources. The first is the restricted version of the US natality files. So this is data on birth certificates. So we actually have data on every single infant who was born in the US since 1988. So this is not a sample, this is the entire population, the entire universe of all births that occurred in the US, and this gives us over 91 million records. And so we have data on the infants as well as their mothers. And then we also use various versions of the CPS. This is the same data set that the BLS uses to compute the unemployment rate every month. And so we obtain economic data from the CPS, household earnings, personal income, hourly income, hourly wages, and so on. And then we merge both of these data sets to detailed measures of the minimum wage and various other policies that were occurring over this time period. Uh, we apply a series of econometric models to these data, which I can talk about um, at some point during the poster. Um, and these models are aimed at teasing out causal effects using quasi-experimental variation. So what do we find? So we find consistent and robust evidence that a higher minimum wage does have positive spillover effects on infant health. That is, it improves infant health across several margins. Birth weight, low birth weight, fetal growth, gestational age, prematurity. We also find that the effects are quite heterogeneous, so not all groups benefit from this. Um, the groups that benefit the most are low-educated young mothers and low-educated non-white mothers. So these are the groups who are most likely to work at minimum wage jobs, and these are the groups who are most likely to be affected by minimum wage policy. So it's validating that these are the groups that we actually see the strongest effects in terms of infant health. Uh, we also look at some mechanisms from the birth records. So minimum wage jobs typically lack health insurance. And so one way in which the minimum wage is helping these mothers is by improving access to prenatal care and allowing them to access prenatal care at a more timely um, measure. We also find reduction in prenatal smoking. And I can talk about what the economic rationale for that is. And finally, we use these effects to do some simulations. That is, we ask ourselves, based on these models, what would happen if the national minimum wage were to be raised from its current rate of $7.25 to $15 an hour? And so our estimates suggest that this would increase birth weight on average by about 2.6% and reduce low birth weight, the prevalence of low birth weight, by about one to two percentage points, which is about an 18% decrease. So again, low birth weight is a very, very serious outcome for infants, um, and it has potentially adverse consequences into adulthood as well. So any policy that has the capacity to reduce low birth weight by even four or five percent is not a non-trivial feat. And finally, um, just recently, it was very gratifying. It's not a published study, um, but it was recently cited in congressional testimony and in a White House report on the minimum wage. So we were appreciated that too much. Um, so thank you again. That's all I have. Do we have any questions of this panel? Um, my question is sort of a comment for Ming Fei. Yes. Which is, before coming to Bentley, I, I spent 12 years teaching at the Massachusetts College of Pharmacy, and I became friends with a lot of hospital pharmacy directors. And they would tell me when they would watch the numbers on what doctors were writing for what drugs and for how much, that when they would see these spike ups, they could always trace it to the first day that a television ad debuted <laughs> for that drug. And I've noticed that now, there's, do you think your first drug isn't working for you? The television ad says, add the second drug too. So go to your doctor and demand the second drug. So there's a very interesting interplay because the physicians are also flagging, waving the white flag of surrender in the prescription pad and just giving up and not being assertive in terms of what might be ultimately the best for the patient based on real data. So it's a comment maybe to think about that interplay too. Yes, yes. Actually, uh, during our study, this is only one of part of our study. Yeah. We also have the analysis on fall of wagon event, which is the first initiation medication, and how long is going to change the medication plan. And we found out that the combo therapy, also the worst one. So we found out that Valparade actually was winner in that kind of a study. But we want to, we need, of course, we're based on the secondary observation data. This is not clinical trial. So there's certainly definitely, uh, definitely uh, uh, limitations on our study. But yes, we did consider about that in our project. Thank you, Helen. <laughs> Hey Rob, this is the uh, second time I've got to hear about indicators, so I'm excited about it. 
you mentioned maybe a semantic difference, but when does that kind of intensity of indicators become a focusing event? Or, or is it semantic? I don't know. Yeah, no, it's, it, it, it's it, it, right now I would say it's semantic. And, and actually in the, the paper that's under review right now, uh, one of the things I suggest is that we're going to have to, and maybe this will be my next paper, come up with some sort of threshold model for distinguishing between the two. Um, what seems to be the difference is a, a focusing event is typically devi defined as an event that aggregates death immediately, right? So if you were to think of a plane crash, a hurricane, usually a lot of those deaths will occur within a week, you know, period after that disaster, depending on how quickly the recovery happens. So right now, that's the distinction. Um, but yeah, I think it's very, you know, if you were to look at someone, the, something like the, you know, e Ebola in 2014, most of those cases were clustered within three months, four months, right? Early summer, or midsummer to early fall. Uh, so that, I think the literature is gonna have to assess that out more. Okay, thank you, oh, one more. Question for, I'm not sure how to pronounce your name, is it Nilam, Nilam? Yeah, Nilam. Nilam. Yeah. Um, so I thought it was very interesting that you showed how, for instance, when a drug is being in early stages of development, then you have words like murine for um, yes, rat or mouse, right? Yes. And that goes down and human words go up. But I didn't quite understand how that could be used to forecast drug development. Like it seemed to me to be a post hoc analysis and mm -hmm. so I, I missed the step between seeing how the use of words change and being able to forecast going forward. The concept here is that uh, during uh, we, we want to monitor this for the more than 500 technology and we want to monitor the word usage and we are kind of trying to check whether if the word usage becomes over the time then we can forecast that the drug approval or the establishment for that technology is going to appear within next two, three years. So that's how we are trying to forecast that the technology will mature within the two, three years because the word usage is becoming constant over the time and it has passed the exponential phase. So if I can just come back, so that means that your tool would be an investor's tool, right? Kind of. Fair. Yes. Yeah, it, get, it gets at the difference between sort of expert perspective and expert systems. The experts have a 90% failure rate. We think there's room for improvement. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank you.